Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to the press conference today to announce the winner of the Angry Women Award. Um, I'm very pleased to have with me here on the panel Naomi Klein. Dorothy, Dorothy Guerrero. <laughs> Dorothy Guerrero from Focus on the Global South and Paul de Klerk from Friends of the Earth International. I'm going to start by handing over to Paul de Klerk, who is going to explain about the background to the Angry Women Award. Yes, good morning and welcome. <clears throat> I'm going to say a couple of words on uh, why we are organizing this award, uh, the process that we've uh, taken to, to get to, the, to here, and I'm going to say a very brief uh, introduction in each of the eight nominations. But why are we doing this award? Uh, if you're following, if you followed climate change neg negotiations, then you've seen that over the last years, really thousands and thousands of lobbyists have uh, become involved in these negotiations. Uh, the chemical industry, oil and gas companies, food industry, producers of biofuels, coal producers, bankers, traders, all of them are massively involved in lobbying on national level in uh, European countries, in the US and increasingly also in southern countries. But also we've seen more and more trade associations being involved in lobbying at the European level towards European institutions and also towards global uh, UN institutions. These corporate lobby groups, they have been very successful over the last years. They have been so successful that they have steered the debate on what solutions uh, are being discussed in the negotiations. Just to give you two examples. At the European level, the European Commission last year uh, approved or uh, uh, renewed the European emission trading system. But instead of asking uh, having companies pay for the permits, almost all of the dirtiest industry from chemical companies to oil and cement producers were excluded from paying for, uh, for their emission permits. This was due to their heavy lobbying from CEFIC, uh, which is one of the nominations. Another example is biofuels. Biofuels over the last years have been strongly promoted as a solution to climate change, despite of the negative environmental and social impacts and the food impacts. So what we see is that the UN climate negotiations are moving further and further away from commitments from rich countries to reduce their emissions at home. We see that the solutions pushed for are mainly instruments that will generate big profits for companies, while most of these instruments do not result in reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and some of them are even destroying the environment and co local communities' rights. The corporate lobby has played a crucial role in this development. And with the Angry Mermaid Award, we want to expose that role. We want to show the public and decision makers how corporate lobbyists are undermining effective action on climate change and promoting false solutions. What we've done to come to here is um, we have, in, in August, September, we have solicited uh, nominations via internet. The next step was that we received about 25 nominations of corporate lobby groups. The organizers of the award have narrowed that 25 um, nominations to eight groups that were being proposed here. Based on criteria such as the quality of the nomination, diversity of sectors, the reg a regional balance and the contribution of these lobby groups to undermining climate change policies. We have then asked the public to vote for what they believe is the worst corporate lobby group. And this was possible either via internet or by filling in postcards which we have distributed over here at the Klima Forum and at the Bella Center. And the result is that we have casted about 10,000 votes which the winner will be presented later. A couple of words on each of the eight nominees. The first is the American Petroleum Institute. They are nominated for spending millions on lobbying against the US climate commitments and setting up a fake campaign where oil industry workers pretended to act as concerned citizens. The second one is the International Air Travel Association for lobbying the UN against binding targets for the airlines over the last more than five to 10 years. The third is Sasol, a South African oil company for promoting coals to liquid, a technique that produces about two times more CO2 as regular oil and will keep the world on the fossil fuel track. Number four is Shell, 
for lobbying heavily, for being in, investing heavily in oil sands in Canada that result in much higher CO2 emissions and for lobbying at the EU level against EU policies to reduce emissions from car fuels. The fifth one is the International Emission Trading Association for promoting clean development mechanisms and carbon trading as the solution to climate change, uh, but hardly contributes to CO2 um, lower emissions. Number six is Monsanto for promoting GM soy as a solution to the climate cr crisis, while the expansion of soy in Latin America leads to deforestation and increased emissions. Number six, the European Chemical Lobby, as mentioned already, for their lobbying against EU climate targets and for getting free permits for the chemical industry. And finally, the American Coalition for Clean Coal Electricity, for lobbying against US climate policies with a fraudulent letter writing campaign where they even used fake lobby letters. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Dorothy Guerrero, who's going to talk about the impacts on um, communities of this corporate lobbying. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming here and sharing your time with us. A focus on the Global South works in India, in Thailand, the Philippines, and China, so mostly in Asian countries, but we also work in many communities and social movements in Latin America and Africa. What I would say um, for this award is that um, if we, talk, if we think of corporations, for many communities in the South, they had been climate criminals for so long, even before all these negotiations. And for many of these developing countries, corporations are more powerful, or as powerful as governments, because in terms of reach and influence, they can reach far-flung areas better than governments. In developing countries, many of the governments are weak, their services are not felt, by, by the grassroots, and corporations have more money and power to reach them. So many of the past development projects, or, or projects done in the name of developments, uh, for example, the Monsanto, had been very, very controversial in India, in the Philippines, and now gaining um, a bad, bad reputation in China. Because many of the development projects are being done in partnership between the governments and these corporations, and for many, poor communities, when something in the name of development is done, they have no power to resist, they have no power to question the projects. And, uh, or if they will resist, or if, or if there will be questions, the power of the state will be used to crush their protests. And um, in India, that, that, that's, that has been seen for so, for so long and for many, many years. BT Cotton is one bad example, wherein the military can be used by the government to quell any protest. Um, thirdly, in, in negotiations, in the crucial negotiations like this, wherein the everyday process of struggling by people in the communities um, are getting so little space, the voices of big corporations are crowding out the voices of the communities that must be heard in the negotiation. It is bad enough that going and following to every cop is different and difficult for many of, many of these small communities, but getting accreditation, um, the, the numbers and the limits that they get in, in being heard, being present here, is another problem. So even, even if we talk about of the second badge now, many of the corporations, even if the secondary badge will be applied to them, since they are also considered as, as NGO, they will still have far more negotiators here, or far more lobbyists here, than any big social movements representing the South. Um, so for, for, for many of the communities, um, with or without the COP, they view or they see, they experience these corporations as part of their lives, as part of the power that is um, taking their livelihoods away, as part of the power that is making their life more and more difficult. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dorothy. I'm now going to hand to Naomi Klein to announce the winner. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be able to announce the winner of the Angry Mermaid Award. Uh, as you heard, there was an embarrassment of riches, uh, uh, emphasis on rich, um, in the nominees. And, um, you know, I, I have been here for, since, since the first day, and one of the things that's really struck me here in the Bella Center 
um, is that while there are endless sessions about how poor countries should adapt to climate change, there are very few sessions, if any, that are looking at the role that corporations are playing uh, in creating this crisis. This is a very polite affair. We don't like to name names here in the Bella Center. Um, we can talk about governments and give them fossils of the day, um, but we aren't talking about who's behind those governments, and that's what the Angry Mermaid Award is all about and why I'm proud to be a part of it. There are so many common sense solutions to this collective crisis that we are not talking about. Why aren't we talking about windfall profit taxes on the oil and gas industry? Why isn't that an issue here inside the Bella Center? Why are we not talking about the need to shut down the Canadian tar sands? I say this as a Canadian. My country is a climate criminal. We signed the Kyoto Protocol and our emissions went up by 26%. We sit here talking about legally binding agreements, but it doesn't mean anything if the power of the fossil fuel lobby nixes the enforcement of those agreements. And yet we're not talking about the oil and gas companies behind the tar sands who are profiting. You're all journalists here. I'm a journalist. Our job is to follow the money, and that's what this award is about. A little bit of name naming. We talk about the need for the developing world to go green, yet where are we talking about the desperate need for intellectual property law reform? How is the developing world going to be able to afford the green technologies that are being trumpeted here unless there is dramatic reform of the same laws that kept AIDS medications out of the reach of the developing world? That's what this discussion is about. Um, tomorrow, the streets of Copenhagen and outside of the Bella Center will be filled with protests once again. The, the, the slogan, uh, the focus of the Reclaim Power protests is denouncing false solutions and creating space to talk about those real solutions that are finding so little space inside the Bella Center. But here today, what we're talking about is why the incredible power that has kept those real solutions off the agenda. And it isn't just about who is in the hallways here. So much of the corporate lobbying, of course, took place long before this conference started. And it's focused on, in particular, the US Congress, which is the single greatest barrier to a fair climate deal, so that by the time we all gathered here, the deal had already been struck in the United States. So we're outing the lobbyists. And this is something that um, activists in the United States have started to do more and more. You know, activists, uh, um, lobbyists love anonymity. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to do is drag them out of the shadows and into the light. Um, one of the persistent themes in the discussion about real solutions versus, versus false solutions is that for many of these so-called market-based solutions, it isn't simply that they don't solve the, the, the climate crisis, which they don't. It's also that in many cases, they make it worse. They make it worse by act actively displacing the very people who are living most sustainably on the land. Um, small-scale farming, indigenous people. That's what's at stake in these negotiations. And the winners of the Angry Mermaid Award um, reflect these concerns, the ones that I've mentioned. So uh, I am very pleased to announce that the winner of the Angry Mermaid Award is, in third place, with 14% of the vote, the American Petroleum Institute. They received 1,390 votes. In second place, with 18% of the vote, is Royal Dutch Shell. Uh, they received 1,810 votes. And in first place, with a, a decisive margin, with 36% of the vote, is Monsanto, with 3,759 votes. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. I'd now like to invite anybody to ask questions. If you could say where you're from um, when, when you ask a question. Thanks. Um, start with the microphone. Do we have, do we have a microphone? Thank you. Michael McCarthy, the Independence Member. Uh, could you say something about, a bit more about why you think Monsanto deserves this award? Paul, would you like to? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, it's not us who think that they deserve the award, it's the people who voted who decided that Monsanto uh, gets the award. I think one of the, we, uh, we were also surprised that Monsanto uh, uh, won the award, but I think the main reason uh, why they have uh, won the award is that um, with some of the other nominees like uh, Shell or the American Petroleum Institute, it's obvious that they have a negative impact on climate change with oil production, uh, gas production. With Monsanto, um, I think people are struck by the fact that a company which is producing uh, such uh, uh, products with such negative impact, uh, uh, genetically modified um, soy, uh, also uh, products that uh, contribute uh, to biofuels, agrofuels, uh, people are struck by the fact that this company will be able to get credits, carbon credits and public subsidies from the UN FCCC process. People find that outrageous that a company with such a bad impact on deforestation, on the rights of farmers, on the rights of local communities, that even that kind of technology, that kind of company will be able to profit, to make profits from this process. And I think that's one of the main reasons why people have voted for Monsanto. There's also a huge amount of opportunism in, in Monsanto's position here um, in the really r the repackaging of Roundup Ready um, as a climate friendly uh, uh, a crop. We've also heard the term uh, climate ready. Um, this is th th this is a, a this is a seed that has been rejected decisively around the world. I mean, this, there's been a decade of prote of protests about this. So one of the things you know, as you know, that I've written about is the way in which corporations take advantage of crisis, take advantage of disasters to do things that they aren't able to do, really to get around democracy. And that this repackaging of Roundup Ready, uh, I think, definitely fits in that category.